Thank you, and I think I will just start out um, in the spirit of full disclosure. Yes, I have actually sung karaoke on this stage before. And so I'm thinking if nothing is thrown at me tonight, I'm going to consider it a big win. So I'm going to dig in with you um, to homelessness in our community. And so I'm going to start out by asking you a question. And the question is, by a show of hands, if you can tell me how many of you have actually come into contact with someone experiencing homelessness in our community? So quite a few. I'm just going to sort of guesstimate and maybe say that that was 20%. And so for the 80% of you who did not raise your hands, um, I'm going to tell you with almost absolute certainty uh, that you probably actually have and you just haven't known it. And so why do I say that? I say that because of the over 500 families that the Community Resource Center has sheltered in the last five and a half years, the majority of them have been working and had jobs in our community. And so I think the perception that most of us have of homelessness is different than what the reality of homelessness actually looks like. And so let me tell you what I mean. If you were to open your computer and go to the search engine and type in the word homelessness, this is most likely what you would see. And so these images, certainly these, these folks are homeless. Um, this is typically what homelessness might look like in an urban community. But here in the suburb of Matamidi, the reality of what homelessness looks like are these are these folks. So now the question becomes, why are families falling into homelessness? The, the, there are probably too many answers to that question um, to answer. Um, but I think it all stems basically from two reasons. And one is that our wages are not keeping up with our cost of living. And so cost of living in the Twin Cities metro area is over $47,000 a year for a family of four. So if you have maybe a single mom working full time, uh, let's say she's making $11 an hour, we'll go higher than the minimum wage, um, she's not even making half of what she needs to to get by. And if you have a two-parent household, you're getting close to this, but you're not even still making it. 70% um, of who we shelter are single women with children, 10% are single men with children, and 20% are two-parent households. The other reason I'd like to highlight is that 62% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings and that 21% have no savings account at all. So for 21% 20, of us, we're not that far away from if life were to throw us a curveball that maybe this could happen to us. I share with you the story of a mom that we recently sheltered. Uh, she was a single mom working full-time, three children, and her car broke down. And so she was faced with the decision of having to pay $300 to get her car fixed um, or paying the rent in two weeks. So logically, she thought about it. If she doesn't get her car fixed, she won't be able to get to work. And we have no pub public transportation in the suburbs. So she chose to get her car fixed, and she thought, well, I'll pick up some extra hours in the next couple weeks so I can make rent. So that's what she did, she got the car fixed. The very next week, her child wakes up with a fever. So she couldn't go to work and she stayed home. Uh, he stayed home from school and she stayed with him. The next day, he wakes up and he's in worse shape. And so she stays home again and takes him to the doctor. And of course, you know, he has strep throat, pretty common. So she takes him to the doctor, he needs an antibiotic. Now he can't go back for another 24 hours until it kicks in. So now she's missed three days of work and she doesn't get sick time. So now she's behind. It comes time for rent and she can't make it. And then the next month she's not able to catch up either. So very easily you can see how someone can fall into homelessness with just a very slight curveball thrown their way. 
So the question becomes, when this happens to families, where are they staying? Most commonly, they're gonna call a family member and ask to stay with them. And that usually works out okay, um, but most of the time, they are in an overcrowded apartment and um, staying until basically the landlord finds out that they're staying there and then they get kicked out. So they maybe will call another family member or a friend and they will basically do this until they have exhausted all of their resources. So when they get done staying everywhere that they possibly could stay, now this is where I can't believe the ingenuity that people have when they have to figure out where they can stay. Some of them will figure out which bus route goes all night and they'll jump on a bus. Um, some of them will maybe go to the lobby of a hospital and stay there. Um, I once met a woman who found a foreclosed home and stayed on the porch with her child. Most commonly though, you have, maybe many of you have heard, is that if you're homeless in the suburbs, most commonly you're gonna stay in your car, if you have a car. So I want us just for a second to think about what that might be like if you actually had to live in your car. Picture the car you're driving. Picture putting your family in it. And now you have to think about things like, geez, where are we gonna park? Where are your kids gonna do their homework? Where are you gonna go to the bathroom? When you get up in the morning, where and what are you gonna have for breakfast? Where do you wash up? Where do you shower? Where do you brush your teeth? Right? So, so these are the, the real situations that people in our community are facing today. I'm gonna back up. There's also three common themes, actually, that we hear from these families who are sleeping in their car. And so the first one, they all express that they feel um, isolated. They don't feel like they're part of a community, right? And then the second one is that after staying in their car night after night and not seeing a change in sight, they really basically become hopeless. And then the third one, which I think is actually the worst of all, is they think that nobody cares. So now we go to what is being done in our community. So St. Andrew's Lutheran Church has opened a community resource center five and a half years ago to address homelessness. Um, specifically, the first thing we try to do is homeless prevention. So we have a rental assistance program. So let's say the woman whose car broke down, maybe we could have given her the $300 so she didn't have to experience that episode of homelessness. There are a lot of other things we can do to lift people up and keep them um, keep them riding stable, um, and that is to help them with their basic needs. And so we have um, all those things that are expensive that we need every month, the laundry soap, the deodorant, the shampoo, the razors, all of that. So we have all of that available. Um, clothing, you know, by the time families get to us after they've stayed multiple places, they have left most of their belongings behind. And so we offer clothing. Um, Typically, seasons have changed and kids have grown. And so we try to address that basic need as well. Um, and when folks don't come in and ask for help with these, um, with these peripheral expenses, um, that's when we go ahead and, and need to provide shelter. So there are many uh, agencies and partners that we have that help our community and help our homeless population. Um, first of all, Guardian Angels Catholic Church has stepped up and offered, they have an empty rectory building. And so we are able to use that as our overnight shelter uh, for our families who are experiencing homelessness. We are talking uh, also with St. Genevieve's in Hugo about forming a partnership to use their rectory building for the same exact thing. So hopefully being able to shelter some more families. We have um, a handful of churches who have um, contacted us and who have houses on their property where we can take our families who are in shelter and that can be a next step for them to stay six months to a year while we provide case management um, just to give them a little extra time till they can get on their feet. And that is St. Michael's in Stillwater, 
Bayport Lutheran Church helps us out, um, Eastern Heights, um, Slumberland Furniture has stepped up and said they have beds for kids. And so now that's been a great partnership. And so now we're able to access things like that for our families as well. So really the whole community is pitching in. We have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that help us um, on a daily basis. We have a free community meal on Thursday nights. Um, and we do help with food as well. Um, we're not a food shelf, but we do supplement food shelf visits um, by providing food for families. And so what can you do? So that's kind of a loaded question. Um, I'm going to start out by saying um, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to sort of bring awareness to the homelessness issue in our community. Um, I think that Jesus makes it very clear when he instructs us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and shelter the homeless. Um, but it really doesn't matter what religion you are. Um, every religion that I know of basically um, calls us to love our neighbor. And I say love as, um, as an action verb and not, just, um, and not just a feeling. I also think it's fabulous that we have a Catholic Pope right now who I think, um, well, he's more than just a Catholic Pope. He's really a world leader. And I think he's calling us all to a better game. So what can you do? Concretely, you could volunteer for existing programs. Um, all the places that I mentioned tonight are, um, rely heavily on volunteers. And I get it, everybody's busy. And so if you're somebody that doesn't have a lot of extra time, I would say that you could financially support local efforts that are already being made. And lastly, um, I think if you just all sort of listen for opportunities and what might be out there that you could do. Um, I'm sort of hooked on this whole, I can't, I can't believe actually the Community Resource Center within a 10 mile radius, we have two empty rectory buildings that we are able to shelter homeless families in. I can't even imagine how many empty rectory buildings there are across the United States, sitting and waiting for something good to be done with them. And what would happen if those of us with resources would use our ingenuity and figure out how to help these families out and get them into a safe place to stay? I'm going to leave you tonight with one of my favorite quotes from Pope Francis. And he says this. To love God and neighbor is not something abstract, but profoundly concrete. It means seeing in every person the face of the Lord to be served, to serve him concretely. And you are, dear brothers and sisters, the face of Jesus. Thanks for listening. <laughs>